One may be flying in by helicopter, while the other is expected to take a more sustainable route up the mountain. But if rumor is to be believed, the snowy alpine resort of Davos could be the setting of an unlikely encounter, Greta Thunberg and Donald Trump. World Economic Forum founder Klaus Schwab, though, was playing down whether he would attempt to orchestrate a handshake. We try and to endeavor to engineer something. I think uh, the best things are those who just happen and afterwards have a positive impact. Yeah. With sustainability the main theme of the annual summit, pressure has never been more intense on governments to act. But will we see more CEOs following suit? The World Economic Forum is trying to force their hand by introducing a scorecard. It will rate companies on the basis of environmental and social performance, although they haven't said whether firms will be struck off the Davos guest list if they don't score well. We are faced with an urgency. We see a window uh, for action closing. And that's the reason why we put so much emphasis on the issue of climate uh, during this 50th anniversary. U.S. President Donald Trump is expected to dominate headlines again if he shows up, while some world leaders will skip this year's Davos. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has told his ministers to avoid an event seen by many as elitist. Although Schwab insists Johnson told him he'd be back next year. In a bid to preempt criticism that its jet-set guests are part of the problem, the World Economic Forum says this year's Davos will be fully carbon neutral for the first time. Now, President Cyril Ramaphosa has opted to skip this year's World Economic Forum's annual meeting to focus on some of his domestic and continental responsibilities. South Africa will be represented at the WEF meeting by the Ministers of Finance, Tito Mboweni, the International Relations and Cooperation Minister, Dr. Naledi Pando, and the Trade and Industry Minister, Ibrahim Patel. Now, the Masmat and Aspen Pharmacare chairperson, Gusen Lamini, joins us now via Skype from Durban to share his thoughts on next week's gathering in Davos. Mr. Lamini, very good evening to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Thank you very much. Happy New Year to you, Simpiwa, and your colleagues. It's great to be on your show. Happy New Year to you too. Hope you have a great year. Now, first of all, what do you make of President Ramaphosa's decision to skip the WEF next week? Given the economic challenges currently facing the country, uh, we know from a statement uh, from the presidency saying that uh, he needs to address the domestic issues and as well as prepare for, uh, for South Africa's uh, chairperson, uh, or rather, yeah, chairpersonship of the African Union. But then some analysts saying that he, he was actually avoiding the embarrassment of having to field questions with regards to, uh, you know, the economic issues currently facing the country? I think it's a very powerful message that President Ramaphosa is sending by not attending Davos this year in, in the sense that we've got a very crowded domestic agenda and as you have just rightly said, he's also preparing to assume the chairmanship of the African Union, which is a very significant role from a regional perspective. So I think uh, the, the combination of regional and domestic factors and indeed the fact that we've got uh, big challenges such as uh, our energy security and the stability of our national grid, which is always very fragile. I think it makes sense for the president to really stay home and uh, focus on the domestic uh, priorities that he has to deal with. It will be seen as insensitive if he was, if he was seen to be out in divorce and um, leaving the country really not being sure whether there will be lot shedding or not. Now, what message do you think South Africa will have to communicate at the Davos meeting, you know, you know uh, that, that will be used as a trump card to lure more investors into the country? I think uh, Team South Africa, led by Finance Minister Tito Mboweni and the Minister for International Relations and Cooperation, uh, Dr. Naledi Pando, has got to communicate the message around some of the reforms, the confidence-building reforms, that have happened and that are happening in South Africa to rebuild institutions, to really push back against um, corruption and to strengthen the primacy and efficacy of institutions. And indeed, to really point to the fact that South Africa remains the most industrialized economy on the African continent and by all accounts, the most trusted and reliable gateway to the rest 
of the African continent, as indeed I think it is and will remain the case if it continues to do the right things. But if we don't do the right things, other countries such as Kenya and Nigeria and Ethiopia are really positioning themselves as very competitive regional economic players. As someone who no doubt has been to Davos, what are some of the tough questions do you think that Team South Africa will face from uh, the international investors in Switzerland? Yeah, I think investors have had all the nice talk which Team South Africa has uh, been known for over the last few years, uh, being very high profile with their scarves bearing the national the flag, the colours of the national flag. I think now it's more really about concrete changes, concrete actions. It's not about talk, but what, about what has been done, what will be done, what are the results, what, what, what changes um, are being made on the ground to really rebuild institutions and reinforce investor confidence. I mean, South Africa is competing against other emerging, emerging markets, such as India, Brazil, Indonesia, and Malaysia, which are doing the right things to attract investors. And investors today, because of social media and globalization have got visibility on what is happening. Actually, their source of information is not just what Team South Africa says. They've got alternative sources of information about what's happening. So you can't fool them. You can't lie to them. And I think the thing that's required is really honesty about what is working well, what is not working well, what are the gaps, what's the strategy to address the gaps that are there. Now, in the past decade, uh, growth has been uh, incredibly slow in South Africa and progress in several areas has stalled, such as uh, service delivery. And, of course, corruption has undermined the key institutions in the country and uh, state-owned entities. Well, the argument may be made that that's as a result of uh, corporate governance failures in South Africa. But then uh, I think we should rather lavish uh, our attention to some of the critical policy missteps that the country has found itself in. What are those missteps and how can they be corrected? I think one of the challenges we face is lack of decisiveness in really taking bold actions and concrete moves that are going to move the dial in addressing the infrastructure challenges that we face as a country, the energy security issues that we face. Let's face it, simply without energy security, you can do all what you want to do to tell investors come and invest, but they'll ask you, what, what about the lights? Do I have energy security? Do I have water security? Uh, can I rely on, on your port and your railways to be able to, to really move my goods around if I need to? It's really going back to the basics, if one may use uh, the, 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 that word. Going back to the basics and fixing the issues that matter to, to underpin a globally competitive economy, which South Africa can indeed be, and indeed must be, and has all what it takes uh, to be, actually. Uh, we have allowed SAA to lose its way. We have allowed ESCOM to lose its way. Not long ago, it was known as the most reliable uh, energy utility in, in the world, actually, not just in Africa, but in the world, supplying abundant cheap electricity. We even used to use that concept in marketing South Africa. We've allowed some of our key institutions, I mean, Transnet, remains has got pockets of excellence but it's lost its way now there's still a vacuum at the top so it's really for us to go back to the basics and luckily the problems or should i say challenges that we face the problems are not insurmountable they just need us to go back to the basics and do what is required to get them right as you said it's about governance fixing governance doesn't cost a lot it's about leadership fixing leadership doesn't cost a lot the technical issues we face the operational issues we face at escom we've got all the engineering skills and all the managerial expertise that is required to fix escom in this country and indeed, you can't indeed. write there that uh, South Africa needs to go back to the basics in order to identify some of the key areas which will enable it to, you know, to build on its potential. Now, Mr. Lamine, earlier on, we've seen the World Bank downgrading its global growth forecast by, uh, I mean, for, for 2020 by 0 0.2 percentage points to 2.5 percent. But then uh, the, the bank warned that the easing of the trade tensions between the United States and China should not be in any way an indication that this would ease or rather 
uh, improve uh, the economic uh, impro e economic growth prospects uh, around the world. So the big question then remains is uh, whether the fresh stimulus efforts are needed, and if so. Who should be responsible for these uh, stimulus efforts? Should it be the governments or the central banks? Well, I think the governments and the central banks need to work in a joint up way that uh, results in coordinated action that promotes the fundamentals that are required to generate the growth that we need. For us, as an emerging market, to grow at less than 1%, look at China, is growing at 6.3%. Look at our peers in Ethiopia, they're projected to grow at around double-digit growth. Ghana is at 8.3% or so. And I think it's really about a coordinated action that is required, that, that, that must be unleashed in order to really propel us to grow at the right level, like our emerging market peers. And we are obviously inextricably intertwined with the global economy because we are very much tied to North America as we are to China. And what happens between China and North America in terms of the trade war does impact on South Africa. But the challenge for South Africa is to look at the opportunities that are there in the context of the trade war between Washington and Beijing and to really maximize opportunities, especially around export industries, our manufacturing sector, the opportunities that are there in our renewable energy sector, they are really massive. The opportunities that are there in the ICT sector, which we have not started tapping into, we have not started creating the right ecosystem for young entrepreneurs to play in the tech sector, the fintech sector, that area of innovation where you're seeing growth coming from when you look at other economies. And uh, still on your point of uh, the export industries, uh, how do we, or rather, how can South Africa diversify its export basket further and move towards a, a higher productivity and global competitiveness? It's really creating a conducive environment for manufacturing industries to locate in South Africa and also creating a, a, a conducive environment for the export part of our economy to be able to take advantage of the global uh, markets that are there. We are a very small market on our own. Even if we can have a big auto sector, there's a limited number of people that can purchase cars. But we can position ourselves as a global center of excellence for automobile manufacturing for the 7.3 billion people in the world. We can position ourselves as a global center of excellence for the manufacturing of electronic goods for the 7.3 3 billion people in the world. Look at countries such as South Korea, with almost a similar population as South Africa. They've managed to position themselves as world-class exporting economies. And we look, South Korea was in the same position as most African economies like Ghana in the last 50 years. But today, they're a first world economy. Most households, are, households around the world have got products that are manufactured and designed uh, from South Korea. I think South Africa has what it takes. You've got world-class universities, world-class think tanks, world-class sci world scientific community, and a very strong culture of innovation. Uh, that is there. We need to just create the right ecosystem so, so that we can be able to be well beaters in everything that we do. Do you think Team South Africa, as we wrap this interview, Mr. Lamini, will have uh, some difficulty in answering questions from investors as to why should they invest in South Africa uh, given the corporate governance uh, challenges, especially in our state-owned entities, given uh, corruption, which still remains in South Africa, and as well as the big question, the ESCOM issue and uh, you know the energy-related uh, concerns or, or failures in South Africa. Why should investors come and invest in South Africa? So from a global comparative perspective, if you look at South Africa in the context of other emerging markets and other economies, there's still a lot going for South Africa. So Team South Africa should not have a problem marketing this great country as a destination of choice for investment. We have problems, yes, and we must be intellectually honest, open and transparent about the problems. But we also have a lot of strengths that differentiate us from other emerging markets. If you look at other emerging markets also in the world, they, they very, look at countries like Turkey, they've had lots of uh, problems, worse problems than we do. Look at Argentina, worse problems, that we, we, worse problems than we do. Look at countries like Venezuela, we're certainly in a much better space. And the, the, the golden opportunity for us is that most of the problems we have are actually, I can argue, they're self-inflicted. 
and therefore we can resolve them and they don't require too much capital or too much you know financial expenditure to, to be resolved they just require decisive leadership coordinated action and they require us to unite around what is good for the national economic interest and ultimately the national interest of all South Africans. And it's really that kind of coordination starts within the ANC itself, stop the factional fights, and then goes to the broader political society, the opposition parties and the ruling party or the governing party, they must unite around issues around what is good for the national economic interest of South Africa. They can differ on other areas, as indeed they must. We need a vibrant democracy where opposition parties and the governing party challenge each other. But as South Africans, we must have a tangible sense of common purpose on how we can build a winning nation that is inclusive and that generates prosperity for generations. Mr. Dabini, thank Mr. you so much for your thoughts. Much appreciated. Thanks that was uh, Marsmart and Aspen Pharmacare Chairperson Gusen Dabini speaking to us live via Skype from Durban and uh, just sharing with us his preview of the upcoming World Economic Forum to be held in Davos next week. It's a wrap for now.